Welcome students to another research study. This one I'm calling the Transcendentalists. Our age is retrospective. It builds the sepulchers of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face, we through their eyes. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition, and a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs? Embosomed for a season in nature, whose floods of life stream around and through us and invite us by the powers they supply to action proportioned to nature. Why should we grope among the dry bones of the past or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? The sun shines today also. There is more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. With those words, Ralph Waldo Emerson launched a movement in the United States known as the Transcendental Movement. Uh, who were the Transcendentalists exactly? What did they believe in? Well, they were a group of American writers, poets, philosophers, naturalists, intellectual, intellectuals, and theologians uh, around the early mid 19th century. They believed that people have a common knowledge about themselves and the world around them that sort of transcends or goes beyond what they can merely see, hear, or taste, touch, or feel. It was a sort of religious slash philosophical slash slash literary movement and yes it is just as confusing as it sounds it was uh, intended to be very mystical and very difficult to kind of uh, pin down the uh, transcendentalists were influenced by european romanticism which itself was a rejection of 18th century rationalism, which we know as the Enlightenment. You can kind of look at it this way. Rationalists in the 18th and early 19th centuries, they believed the answers to life, the universe, and everything could be found through logic and reason, through that sort of uh, methodical investigation of, uh, of empiricism, what you can see and observe, that sort of thing. Romanticists, on the other hand, on the other hand which transcendentalists were a part of, uh, they believed the answers to, to life, the universe, and everything could be found purely through in, introspection, purely through dwelling on it, that, that you had this personal relationship to the universe, and that was how things were figured out. They weren't figured out quantitatively or objectively, they were figured out subjectively. If you're a little lost, well, don't worry. A lot of people were. Transcendentalism was widely misunderstood across the United States, and historically it is criticized as being very difficult to really discern. Uh, so why do we study this very strange movement uh, in the early mid-19th century? Why do we study it as part of our American identity, uh, its origins, its complications and contradictions? Well, um, transcendentalism was the first uniquely American philosophical movement. Yeah, transcendentalism was the first like American philosophy. It was a direct response to America's what was called the, the market revolution in the uh, that began about the 1820s, as historians call it. Uh, and it was shaped by the, the wildness and vastness of America and its frontier. And it was driven by the desire of these uh, the select group of individuals to create something that was uniquely American, to create a unique a uniquely American brand of thought unfortunately it didn't take off quite like they had hoped some of the basic tenets of transcendentalism uh, the things that they believed in one that uh, one should rely more on intuition than on reason to find truth intuition being that sort of inborn understanding of things that really has no defining characteristics that has no reasoning behind it uh, it's the difference between feeling that something is right and understanding why something is right Another uh, basic tenet that one should do, not merely think, one should experience, not merely speculate. That man and nature are inherently good and pure, and that it's society and society's institutions which corrupt the purity of the individual. The uh, Transcendentalists also believe that one should focus on self-improvement before the improvement of others and thus of society. 
And finally, the transcendentalists were religious. They believed in God. However, they believed that God manifested himself inside of everyone in the form of divine intuition and inspiration. They sort of believed that God uh, was sort of uh, the, you know, characterization of the, the spirit that runs through everything in the universe. Think, think like uh, what, what Yoda said in Empire Strikes Back, like the force runs through everything. That's, that's basically what the transcendentalists believed about God. Uh, the Transcendental Club was the primary group that promoted this philosophy. There's lots of members in this club. It was all the major uh, liberal thinkers of the day. Ralph Waldo Emerson was the leader and figurehead. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, we read Walden over the summer. He was a transcendentalist. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, we're reading uh, Scarlet Letter in a couple of weeks. Margaret Fuller was, uh, a, was a woman who started the uh, Transcendentalist literary magazine known as The Dial. Theodore Parker, a Unitarian minister turned transcendentalist, Walt Whitman, the famous American poet, Amos Bronson, Alcott, Orestes Brownson, all of the great uh, writers and religious figures uh, that we remember from that early mid-19th century. They were uh, at one point in time all members of the Transcendental Club. The club was a sort of meeting place for these young thinkers, uh, and it was this organizing ground for the for their to kind of for them to vent their frustration with the uh, general state of American culture. Um, particularly, they were they were concerned with uh, the American intellectual, the state of American intellectualism, or rather, kind of its where it was lacking, uh, and with the Unitarian Church and where the direction it was going. So that is my ultra-condensed explanation of transcendentalism and the transcendentalist movement. I actually have a couple of accompanying videos that I'd like for you to watch if you have time uh, that will help you better understand the time period, the market revolution, which I'm not really sure you guys have gotten to yet in your history classes, and also an explanation uh, from David Shee, uh, who, if uh, that name might sound familiar to you, he's the author of uh, the APUSH textbook you guys are using this year, uh, an explanation from him uh, a little more in detail about transcendentalism and romanticism. So for this research study, got some more key vocabulary like usual. Delegate, the verb, to send or appoint as in a person, uh, as deputy or representative of something, as in to delegate someone with new responsibilities. There's a, uh, the noun version of that is delegation, the process of delegating. Sentiment, a noun, a sort of mental feeling or emotion, as in his decision was based more on sentiment than on reason. That's definitely something that transcendentalists would have believed in doing. The uh, adjective form sentimental and the noun form sentimentality are the words you should know. Uh, the verb debase, to lower in rank, dignity, or in significance, as in he wouldn't debase himself by doing manual labor. And the act of doing that is called debasement. Unit, uh, utility, the state or quality of being useful or usefulness, as in this chemical has no utility as an agricultural fertilizer. The uh, adjective form, uh, one who, uh, the practicing of, of uh, believing in, in utility is, is we call utilitarianism, or utilitarian would be the adjective. Asceticism, that's the doctrine that a person can attain a high spiritual and moral state by practicing self-denial, self-mortification, and the like, as in he practiced asceticism. Uh, basically what this means is when an individual sort of denies him or herself of uh, the, the good things in life, the, um, the enjoyable things, the pleasant things, the, the sensual experiences, those sorts of things, uh, for the purposes of gaining some sort of higher spiritual understanding of the world. Uh, that means practicing asceticism. Think um, uh, Catholic monks, how they you know, strip themselves of all worldly interests. Uh, that is a very ascetic thing to do. A related form of that, ascetic, can be a noun uh, or an adjective. We could say that a person who practices asceticism, we would call them an ascetic, uh, and we would call anything that deals with asceticism, we would call that the adjective ascetic. To proclaim is a verb, to announce or declare in an official or formal manner, to, as in to proclaim war, the noun form of that, proclamation, is one you should know. And finally, conviction, the noun, a fixed or firm belief in something, as in no clever argument, no persuasive fact or theory could make a dent in his conviction in the rightness of his position. And I don't have any related forms of that. So those are the key vocab terms that you should know uh, going into the, uh, to uh, better understand this research study and just to better improve your own vocabulary for the class. 
All right, let's take a look at this week's reading list. Going to start off with uh, the landmark document, the document that kicked it all off, The American Scholar by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, this was adapted from a lecture he delivered at Harvard University back in 1836 or 1837, I believe. This was before there really was a transcendentalist movement, and it was basically from the ideas he delivered in this lecture that uh, the transcendentalist movement was born. Then we have another Ralph Waldo Emerson piece, uh, his landmark essay called Self-Reliance. You cannot go through high school without reading Self-Reliance. It's just something that everyone reads, and it's a, it's a pretty influential document. I really enjoy reading it every year. Uh, we have a response piece to Emerson's Self-Reliance by Benjamin Anastas called The Foul Reign of Emerson's Self-Reliance, uh, kind of putting it into a, a perspective that uh, we don't often consider. Next up, we have an excerpt from Walden, or actually a couple of different excerpts from Walden, which you guys read over the summer, but uh, read these excerpts one, one more time. Uh, then we have a response piece to that called Walden Living Deliberately by Bill McKibben. Uh, another response piece called Doing Nothing by Sue Monk Kidd. And then finally, Ken Ilgunas, uh, his Walden on Wheels, an excerpt from a book that he wrote about his own living experiment, where he, uh, inspired by Thoreau, decided to... Um, as he was going to graduate school at Duke University, live out of his van on campus to avoid accumulating student debt. It's a really fascinating piece there. So that is your reading list. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces this time around. Uh, it's a little bit longer. I'm not going to lie. It's a little longer than what it has been the last couple of weeks. It's definitely over 40 pages this time. So make sure you plan accordingly. It could be you know, 45 pages at least. Um, so make sure you plan accordingly. Don't leave this one to the last minute. And, uh, Go ahead and work on that until Monday. I'll see you in class.